Thank you very much. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to everyone as we are filing in tonight. So happy to see some familiar names in our list of attendees. Welcome, 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 everybody. Thanks for being here. We'll get started in about a minute or so. Um, really appreciate everybody taking time out of their day for tonight's program. Love seeing all these familiar names. Love this little arts loving community that we have together. Thank you again for being here. We'll get started in just a moment. Oh, and I always love it when people tell me where they're from. <laughs> so Ocean Pines, Maryland, wonderful. Love Salem, Mass, and Camden, Maine. Oh, so awesome. I'm coming to you from Manchester, New Hampshire, Burlington, Mass. This is wonderful. Thanks for sharing, everybody. Oh, we got Minneapolis, Minnesota, Croton, wonderful. DC. Florida. Wow. LA, Chicago, what a great group. Even Arizona, this is like really representing all of America tonight. Thank you everybody for being here. This is so exciting to have such a geographically diverse group here tonight. Well, it is 7.02 and I think we are pretty good to get started tonight. Um, if you've never been to one of these programs before, my name is Jane O'Neill and I own the company Culturally Curious. I have a background in art history and in education. I have master's degrees in both fields. So putting together art appreciation programs like this is really my passion and the highest and best use of my skill set. So I appreciate you being here tonight, allowing me to do this. And I know we have several partnering libraries, Amesbury, Chelmsford, Groton, and Tewksbury. So I appreciate all the, those communities coming together to present this and people near and far taking time out of their day to learn a little bit more about these fierce females. You will not be disappointed by the slate of artists tonight because they are all so inspiring in their own way. Now, if you never saw Fierce Females Part One, do not fret. <laughs> it's, um, you, you won't be um, out of the loop for tonight's program. And what I will do is I will, um, well, I can tell you right now, you can just go on YouTube and uh, look up my name and Fierce Females and, and a recording of, of part one will come up. So you can you can get up to speed, but you won't be um, you won't be behind by any stretch of the imagination. So that being said, we'll just very quickly review some of the big ideas from part one so that we're all on the same page. And we will be getting back to the striking photograph over here on the on the left in just a, a moment. So again, welcome everybody. We are about to dive into Fierce Females Women in Art part two. Long awaited, right? Okay, so if you remember part one, we did start off with just a basic comparison of two images that helped to get us oriented in terms of the big picture differences in the way that men and women have historically been portrayed in the history of art. Now, these are broad brushstrokes generalizations that we're making here, but we have um, Hans Holbein's depiction of King Henry VIII over here on the left, and then this stunning odalisque by the French artist Ang on the right. So of course, uh, if we were all in the same room tonight, which someday we will be, hopefully, um, we could have a nice, uh, a very rich discussion about the differences between uh, these two paintings. But maybe off the top of your head, uh, you're already noticing, obviously clothed versus unclothed, um, uh, a position or a stance of power versus this woman who's sort of almost collapsing in on herself. Um, I. I just gave this this presentation in person not too long ago. And I remember somebody said he looks dominant and she looks sort of submissive. So all of these things kind of come together and coalesce to help us understand that because men have been primarily the art makers um, because they've been trained to do so throughout the history of time, most works that depict women are sort of crafted through the gaze of a of, uh, uh, a, a man's eyes, this idea of the implied male gaze when it comes to um, 
the history of painting. And that really means that these images of women are so often uh, objectifying them and they are there for the pleasure and the delight of, of, an, of an assumed male audience. So um, if you remember part one, we talked a lot about why women uh, were kind of barred from participation. If you need that history, you can go back to that video. But for now, we're just going to dive right into being fierce. And I remind you of that definition that we used for part one. Um, women who created art that defied expectations and pushed beyond the boundaries of what was considered appropriate, acceptable, or desirable for their time. And this woman that I have on the screen here certainly qualifies as being fierce. Uh, first of all, the artist is a woman. Her name is Eleanor Brookdale, and she was painting in the pre-Raphaelite uh, style well into the 20th century. In fact, in 1919, she published a little golden book on um, on important women and it, or famous women, I should say. And this is one of the images from that book. It's a depiction of a woman named Kate, Catherine Douglas. She got a nickname based on this heroic thing that she did. She was a lady in waiting to the Queen of Scotland back in the 1400s. And when she realized that there was a conspiracy to kill the king, and on a given night, there was she realized that there was no bolt through the staples of this door to secure the door and protect the king and queen. Catherine Douglas put her own arm there, risking life and limb, knowing that there were um, assassins who were coming to that door to find the king and queen. And ultimately, they did break her arm and storm the room, and they did end up assassinating the king. But Catherine Douglas certainly um, has has um, earned the right to be called fierce. And I would say the artist Eleanor Brookdale did as well for um, for highlighting such courageous women uh, uh, so early in the 20th century. Now, one other fierce female I'd like to share with you, just to get us grounded in this definition of fierce, because it's certainly ever evolving, especially as we move into um, moder the modern era, contemporary times. We are looking at three or four, sorry, four images from Yoko Oma Ono's performance piece called Cut Piece. It's an audience participation performance. And she first did it in 1964. And this is one of like the boldest things I can imagine. Essentially, Yoko Ono sits um, fully clothed in like her favorite outfit on a stage with a pair of sharp scissors next to her. And she has invited everybody in the audience to come up and cut her clothing. And at first people go up and they make very tentative cuts, like a little snip by her collar or on her wrist. But then people get increasingly bold and they begin cutting her clothes off of her, even her undergarments. In one staging of, of this performance, she was left completely nude. But we can see that she's exposed, she's vulnerable, and she sits just passively on the stage through the entire performance. And I can tell you right now, it's uncomfortable to watch um, a woman's clothes be clipped off of them. And there's, I mean, all sorts of, uh, of, of ways to approach this particular uh, performance piece, but it certainly reminds me of this history, of, of the way, of this history in, in the field of art history, of, of depicting women as nude. And this reminder that they've all started off with their clothes on as thinking and feeling human beings. And that's a, a good thing for us to keep in mind as we think about these disparities in the art world. Now I have one more fierce female for you, uh, also on my program overview screen. You won't even be able to read the text because you won't be able to take your eyes off of Alice Neal. <laughs> um, here she has painted her um, nude self-portrait at the age of 80. And if this isn't fierce, I don't know what is. She's just looking so darn confident, just um, absolutely bucking any sort of, of notion of the idealized female form or what she is supposed to be or who, who or what she's supposed to look like. She presents herself um, with, with this incredible honesty. And she actually said uh, she had very pink cheeks while she was painting it because it was, um, it was a physical effort for her to do so as well. It's a stunning piece, uh, the artist Alice Neal there. Now, Tonight, we are going to work our way through this list of impressive artists, starting off in the Renaissance with Sofonisba and Guasola, all the way up to uh, contemporary times with the artist Cindy Sherman. So um, 
let's dive right in, shall we? <laughs> All right. So here we have the artist who has, her name is such a mouthful, a Sofonispa Anguissola, an Italian Renaissance painter. We can see her here in a self-portrait, a remarkable self-portrait. At a young age, she was just in her 20s when she, when she painted this. And it really stands out to me, first of all, in, um, in the way that she's presenting herself as an artist with the tools of her trade here, working uh, at an easel, uh, constructing this image in front of us, but also for the tenderness of the image that she's portrayed here. Uh, images of the Madonna and child were everywhere in the 1500s. Uh, um, it was kind of like a cottage industry for somebody like the artist Raphael, but I don't think I've ever seen such a tender portrayal of the Madonna and child. Here he is standing nude alongside his mother, and she is tenderly uh, holding his head with both of her hands and then leaning in for a kiss. It's uh, To me, it's just a remarkable painting. And so... Um, so similar to the way I think mothers treat their children. So Sofonispa Anguissola came from a very large family and they were kind of a poor nobility. <laughs> Her father ensured that um, that all of his children who were interested in the arts would receive training in the arts. And so she and a number of her sisters were, were trained to paint, but she was the oldest and probably kind of the most skilled in this area. So she ad advanced quickly, so much so that her work became famous in the field. And she actually established a little bit of a pen pal relationship with none other than Michelangelo himself. Her drawings were presented to the Italian Renaissance master, this drawing over here in particular, where we see the smiling girl. And Michelangelo even acknowledged like, this is great work, but he issued this challenge and he said, you know, you can show a smiling girl, but can you show real pain and agony as well? And so she, in response, created this drawing of a little boy who's crying because his finger has been bitten by this crawfish over here. So she... Um, he threw down the gauntlet and, and she met the challenge. What an impressive young lady here, right? Now, she was um, working at a time where uh, there were so few professional women artists. And uh, and if there, if you managed to become a professional woman artist, you were probably just painting uh, floral still lives or something like that when the hierarchy there was like uh, the men were painting the big religious paintings or the historical paintings. But Sofonispa Anguissola actually came up with this new genre, this idea of a portrait that also shows a little slice of life. So it's like a portrait and a genre painting. And we can see that here in what I think is probably her best work or at least her best known work. This is called The Chess Game. And it's a portrayal of her sisters or some of her sisters. This was painted in 1555. So we have all of the lovely details of their clothing, of their hair, their beautiful faces here as they're engaged in this intellectual pursuit. When's the last time you saw a painting of women playing chess, right? Oh, and I should acknowledge that there's also a servant here, an older woman who is looking on at the game. And so with this work, we have uh, kind of the portrayal of the elevated status of the women in this family. I mean, notice the the pearls and the jewels in their hair, but we also have the, the, um, the emotional and the social dynamic between them as this oldest sister here is making her move on the chessboard. Now, Anguissola actually painted this picture right around the time that the rules for chess changed in Italy. And they changed in such a way that the queen all of a sudden had all the power on the board. So Anguissola is almost painting an allegorical picture about her sisters operating as these queens um, who are playing up on this chessboard here. So it's a, a nice nod to the potential of these young women in this picture. Now, Inguisola herself was filled with potential and she was probably the first internationally renowned woman artist. Um, and that drew uh, attention that, that, um, that meant that she was invited to paint outside of her own country. She was actually invited to Spain 
to serve the royal court and she became a lady in waiting and a court painter to the queen of France. This was Elizabeth of Valois. And, um, and so we can see two portraits by Anguissola of the queen. They established a very close working relationship. The queen herself was also a practicing artist. She gave birth to two daughters and Anguissola tutored both of them in how to um, how to be a painter. So this was a nice long relationship of about 14 years that Anguissola was there. And while she was there, she wasn't just painting the queen, she also painted the king. This is Philip II of Spain over here on the left. And on the right, an image that might be familiar to some of you because it's close to home. This is the King Philip the, the II's sister, Johanna or Juana of Austria. And this painting is located at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And both of these works, I should mention, had sort of shaky attributions for a really long time. I think because Anguissola's name was sort of lost to history, that there were um, art historians along the way, or, or at least um, art dealers along the way, looking to increase the value of these works and sold them, as, or at least build them, as being made by, by more famous male artists. And so it's only been in the recent years, probably in the last 25 years, that it was determined that both of these works were made by this incredible woman artist that we're really only beginning to, to fully understand today. And, and now there's so much more value to, to the fact that these are attributed to her because of course we have this renewed interest in the contribution of women towards the arts. Now, when it comes to Anguissola, she had a nice long life. She had two marriages and the second marriage seemed to be for love. It seemed to be a very happy marriage. And she lived to the age of 93. And throughout her life, artists sought her out and looked for advice from her for how to be an artist. This is actually a portrait of her by the English artist, Anthony Van Dyke, who became a preeminent portrait painter in the 1600s. He traveled to Italy to go and meet her and he painted this portrait of her. He thought she was like 96 years old when he painted this, but I think she was about 92. And he said that their conversation taught him more about the true principles of painting than anything else in his life. So for being a, a teacher and a trailblazer, Anguissola definitely qualifies as fierce. Let's turn our attention now to um, France in the Age of Enlightenment. We're going to turn our attention to the artist Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun, and we see her here in this breathtakingly beautiful self-portrait from the age of 16. Now, Vigée Le Brun was somebody who was almost entirely self-taught. She had some education, but not in, in painting per se. It was like in the fine art of conversation and other things like that that could help her land a husband. Um, but she was working as a professional artist by the age of 14. By the age of 19, she was internationally renowned. And within the space of about two years, she was painting kings and queens. So talk about a meteoric rise. Let's talk about why everybody was seeking out Vigie Le Brun's uh, talents. These are two examples of her paintings, her portraits of members of the aristocracy. And you can see here, she could flatter her subjects, but she could also paint um, and portray with astonishing realism, the materials and the fabrics that signified wealth and status at the time. So this is Madame Grand. Maybe you've seen her before. This is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we see here the silk, the satin, the lace, all of it, and even the texture of her hair as she turns her eyes upwards, um, trying to conjured the, the breath to sing the song that's in her hand here. And then over here, we see another lovely woman with a velvet um, lapel on her jacket, and then it's fur lined at the bottom. Again, she's looking at music as well. And it was these types of women, these, these very rich uh, members of the aristocracy, that then recommended Vigie Le Brun's talents to none other than the Queen of France herself. So Vigie Le Brun, at the tender age of 22, meets the monarch of France and has the opportunity to paint her. This is her first portrayal of Marie Antoinette, uh, who was also just 22 years old at the time. 
And Vichy Lebrun sort of nails this opportunity. She shows the queen looking regal as all get out with the very tall hair, the very wide dress, <laughs> and all of the signifiers of status. Here's the crown over here and the portrait bust of her husband up above. Um, Marie Antoinette loved this this uh, portrait. This she thought was like the most successful, the most flattering portrait that she'd had up until this point. She had five copies made and she even sent one to her mother. So a relationship between artist and subject here was sort of cemented. And, um, and Vigie Lebrun would go on to paint Marie Antoinette more, I think about 30 more times over the course of her, her time at, at um, it, 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 uh, painting for the Royals. Incidentally, I just, I just love this dress and there's something so solid about the way Vigie Lebrun has painted it. It almost looks like marble when you look at it. It's really quite impressive. Now, there were a few bumps in the road. I'm sure some of you who've seen some of my other programs remember this particular incident where Vigie Lebrun painted Marie Antoinette in this kind of naturalistic um, uh, outfit where she's holding flowers and she looks like a little bit of a country girl, right? With the straw hat and the loose muslin dress that's just tied with a sash around her waist. Now, this was a picture that was then put on display for, um, for the French public and they went crazy over it and not in a good way. They did not expect to see their, their monarch looking so informal. In fact, this dress that she's wearing was considered a base garment. It was like the kind of thing that you would wear under uh, a more formal garment. So the joke here here is that she painted the queen in her underwear and nobody could really handle it. In fact, this picture was taken off you. Vigie Lebrun had to quickly paint a replacement for it. And within the space of a month, this, um, this much more formal portrayal of the queen, again, in the silks with the lace and the pearls and all of that uh, was put on display instead. Now, um, Vigie Lebrun played an important role in shaping the perception of the queen. It, she was a little bit like a marketing company for the, for the queen because of this kind of rising tide of resentment towards the, the, the monarchy that would eventually lead to um, the, the French Revolution. This was kind of a, a tricky tightrope for Vigie Lebrun to walk. And we can see in this formal portrait, uh, I believe this one is from 1878, if I'm remembering, 18, or sorry, 1787. Um, and we can see in this portrait, the queen is wearing a formal dress, this beautiful red velvet dress that has the fur lining on it. And she is surrounded by her children, a little girl here who curls her arms around the queen's arm and embraces her that way, a babe on her lap and a, another little boy here. Okay. And poignantly, this, um, this child is pointing to an empty, uh, a, an empty bassinet that it has, had been covered with a black cloth indicating that the queen had recently lost a child. So again, there's a, that's a pretty effective way to, to build some, some sympathy for the queen. Uh, but essentially, this is a portrayal of the queen of France uh, looking like the mother of France. This was a really smart move on the part of Vigie Lebrun. That's not to say that she didn't sweat this though. She actually wrote about kind of locking herself in her bathroom and praying that this picture would go over well. And indeed it did. Actually the, the king of France himself praised this painting and told her, I know nothing about art, but I grow to love it through you. So success. Now we know that um, that things don't work out very well for Marie Antoinette. Uh, the painting over here on the left is not done by Vigie Lebrun, but it is a portrayal of the execution of Marie Antoinette several years later. And I talked about this rising tide of resentment against the monarchy as the French Revolution approaches. Really anybody who's associated with the, mar uh, with the monarchy was... Um, was considered a, a real threat to the to the Republic. And Vigie Lebrun sort of knew that her time was up there. We can see her here in this uh, wonderful self-portrait from about 1800. Now, what she decides to do is to get out of Dodge. Art historians call this going into exile, <laughs> but she had to escape under the cover of darkness, basically wearing like a costume. She was dressed in these shabby clothes so nobody could identify her, but she was still followed by spies for days trying to escape 
France. So she makes it out fully intact with her head on her shoulders. And what does she do from there? I mean, the, the king and the queen have been executed. The royal family is no more. Um, Vigie Le Brun has a second act to her credit. She she figures out how to um, to continue making a living for herself as an artist. And what we see her doing over here in the self-portrait is showing herself as an artist at the easel. And she's actually painting Marie Antoinette. And she would use an image like this in order to introduce herself to other um, members of the aristocracy, to other monarchs, um, and show that she was fully qualified and capable of painting their portraits. So she um, she travels quite a bit while she's in exile. She goes uh, throughout Italy to St. Petersburg to Berlin, and she is um, she's fully her her business as an artist is fully flourishing, and she gets to paint all of these important people, including this fellow over here who was uh, the retired king of of. Poland, I believe. And we can see that her, her capabilities have not been diminished at all. I particularly love all of the textures that she's captured here with this ermine lined robe and how he how she just like pulled out all the stops for this portrait of this lovely woman over here who has like the most plump lips and this um this interesting wrapping around her head with the beautiful curls poking through and even a waterfall in the background. So when it comes to Vigi Le Brun, uh, she's really remarkable, not only for her technical gifts, but also for her sympathy with her sitters. But it was her ability to navigate the minefield that was the French Revolution and still come out on top that certainly qualifies her as being fierce. All right, so we're going to zoom forward in time to the 20th century, and our next artist here is Dorothea Lange. She was an American documentary photographer and photojournalist, and we can see her sitting on top of her car with this giant camera here. Now, Lange is best known for her Depression-era work with the Farm Security Administration, and her photographs really helped to humanize um, the challenges of the Great Depression and they influenced not only the development of, of um, documentary photographer, photography, but it, it they also influenced policymaking in the United States. Now, there were two early events that helped to shape Dorothea Lange's life. The first is that she had polio at a very young age and one of her legs um, it ended up being shorter than the other one. She had a pronounced limp uh, she said, it formed me, it guided me, it instructed me, helped me and humiliated me. I've never gotten over it. And I'm aware of the force and power of it. And I think what she's really getting at with a quote like that is that, um, is that, that, that sense of humiliation is something that inspired empathy from her to her subjects throughout her life. And I think we'll see that certainly. Now, the other significant event that happened to her at a young age, I think she was about 12 years old, was that her father left her family and her family ended up moving to a very poor neighborhood in New York City. And it was right around that time um, that, or actually it wasn't at the time, it was a little bit later, but she decided to drop her father's name. And she took on her mother's maiden name, which was Lang here. And we'll see that a number of the artists tonight um, shape their own identity, oftentimes by changing names or rejecting their father's name. Okay, so Dorothea Lang was a pretty independent spirit. She and her friend thought they, they would travel around the world, but by the time they got to San Francisco, they were actually robbed while they were there, and um, and it sort of got waylaid. And it, it, it ended up with Dorothea Lang getting married, having two kids, and setting up her own portrait photography studio and supporting her family for 15 years with her business. And then the Great Depression happens and I'm sure her business dried up and she decides to take her camera and point it outside and document what was happening. And this was actually the very first photograph that she did that she took when um, when she decided to change her focus this way. This is a picture called White Angel Breadline. And it's a remarkable picture in so many ways. We have this one anonymous figure who is sort of centered in the photograph. We we know that all of these gentlemen here are waiting uh, for food. They're, they're waiting uh, to be fed. 
And he has kind of turned his back away from this. We can see just how humble his circumstances are humble or desperate his circumstances are really. Uh, his hat is, is so much more battered than the other hats here. We can see the, the small tear in his jacket and we see him with this empty cup. The brim of his hat covers his eyes, obscures his um, identity, but almost expresses um, a ubiquitous uh, circumstance during the Great Depression. And it emphasizes this sense of hopelessness and despair in such a powerful way. Now, the Farm Security Administration saw this, this photograph at, uh, after the fact, and it, it, um, it prompted them essentially to hire Dorothea Lang to help to document what was happening during the Great Depression. I should mention too, before we move on, that the title of this work, White Angel Breadline, does not actually refer to this man here. The White Angel is in fact another fierce female. Her name was Lois Jordan, and she was a woman that, um, that cooked this food. This was all um, based on donations that she received. But over the course of three years during the Great Depression, she um, fed about a million men. That was, she was the white angel and that's her bread line really. So she needed a shout out. Okay, so Dorothea Lang gets this gig with the Farm Securities Administration and she goes out and about to document what is happening in this country, primarily in California where she was based. So this is another San Francisco picture where we can see these men sleeping in the road on Skid Road, on Skid Row here. And, and, and we see just how desperate their circumstances are. Now, another phenomenon that was happening at the time was the migration of the so-called Okies. Um, all of these people who were heading West called the Okies because there was like this assumption that they were all coming from Oklahoma, but they were there to essentially follow the crops to find find some sort of employment and some food by um, by going to the farms in California. And the Okies were people who were traveling with just the bare necessities. And we can see, you know, like a trash can and a table and a pail attached to the back of this car. And so these were the kinds of things that Dorothea Lang was trying to capture with her photography. And I should say that, that the, the photographers that were working for the Farm Securities Administration had like their own code of ethics and their own sense of social justice at the time. One of the things that that Dorothea Lang did was that she tried to talk to the people that she was uh, photographing and all these photographers really agreed that they were trying to uh, humanize and give as much dignity to their subjects as possible. And that really brings us to her most famous photograph, the so-called migrant mother from 1936 from uh, Nipomo, California. Now, um, of course, this is an image of this worried, concerned looking young mother with surrounded by uh, two small children and a babe in arms here. You sort of get, get the sense of the weight of the world on her shoulders, literally in this moment. But this wasn't just a lucky snap on the part of Dorothea Lang. This is a really uh, calculated photograph and I'm going to sort of walk you through her process and and how she got there. Um, Dorothea Lang had been driving down what was essentially a highway at the time and there was an encampment of uh, of uh, of essentially unhoused people. They were uh, there to pick peas and and the pea crop had frozen. So they were in um, desperate dire straits. These were people who were starving and homeless. And so um, so Dorothea Lang drove past this encampment. She saw a little sign for like the pea pickers camp and she drove, she just kept going on. And about 20 miles later, she just couldn't get this image of this uh, makeshift tent and this family underneath this tent. She couldn't get that image out of her head. And so almost without thinking, she just um, does a U-turn in the middle of the highway and comes back. And as she's approaching this family, we can see these two initial photographs that she takes of this young mother who was actually a mother of seven children, although I think there's only four of them present for, um, or maybe five of them present for, uh, for these particular images. And as she's approaching, she's capturing the details of the encampment here, but she's realizing very quickly that there's no central focus to these images. And you can see people are moving about as she's doing this and she's getting closer and closer. And as she approaches the mother, um, 
she, uh, one of the younger children gets in close and there's this direct contact with, um, or direct eye contact from the mother here. And Dorothea Lang sort of likes the direction that this is moving in, but understands that, uh, that you have like these competing glances here between the child who's making what sort of seems like a silly face and the concerned face of the mother. So Dorothea Lang actually, um, asks the child to step out of the frame. She snaps uh, another picture here where the mother is just nursing her baby, but she's looking downwards. And uh, Dorothea Ling uh, sort of uh, intuitively knew that this wasn't going to be her photograph because going back to this idea that she wanted her her subjects to to uh, to not be ashamed of, of who they were or their circumstances because they were without fault in in <laughs> for their poverty in, during the Great Depression. So she didn't like the idea that her eyes were cast down this way. So from there, she invites another child into the frame. The mother starts looking off into the distance. And again, it's, it's these competing glances, but she likes that the mother's eyes are turned up. And from this moment on, she makes a, a, some very calculated moves. Dorothea Lang um, has, the, has the camera um, rotated in such a way that it's a long uh, landscape format. She moves in closer and she moves to our right and she rotates the, cam the, the camera. She invites another child into the frame, but then instructs them to turn away and um, and even to put their hands on their mother's backs. And so now we, we have the presence of these children, uh, but we have that central focus of the mother's face. Her eyes are not cast downward. Instead, she's looking into the distance. Now her hand is raised to her chin and we get that fear and concern and the pressure that's on her in this moment. And then we, we I, I think everybody sort of then discovers the face of the baby in her arms as well. Now, this incredible photograph was published in um, in a San Francisco newspaper just a day or two after the fact, and um, and people were galvanized by it. In fact, the federal government shipped 20,000 pounds of food to those pea pickers in California because of this image. Lang's pictures literally saved lives. It's pretty amazing to think about that. Now, um, this is not the end of her career by any stretch of the imagination. By the time we get to World War II, the federal government had hired her once again to document uh, the entire process of the internment of Japanese Americans in, in, um, in camps in the United States during World War II, which, of course, was one of the... Um, one of sort of the, the worst violations of human rights that existed um, since the beginning of the of the country. Or, so she uh, she was there with her camera for every step of the, the, the process, the, the the kind of rounding up of these Japanese American families, um, the camps themselves. And we can see in the image over here on the left, the focus on these young, innocent faces like these children, of course, are not a danger or a threat to the United States. The camp depicted over here on the right um, in this kind of barren, desolate region of the Western United States that looks like completely um, uh, windswept and, and sort of covered with this dust. Um, one of her most famous images from this time, and I should state that uh, if, if it's not already totally obvious that Dorothy Ling did not um, did not support the policy of interning Japanese Americans. And so she was there to tell the story as to sort of why they shouldn't be there. And so this remarkable picture at, at, a, at a school where she documented Japanese American children alongside their peers, pledging allegiance to the American flag and then being shipped to an internment camp um, also serves to as uh, one of her most remarkable and impactful images. Now, Dorothea Lang overcame her own obstacles to stand on her own and put a, a face to injustice and, and suffering. For changing and in some cases saving lives, she definitely qualifies as fierce. Now, our next artist might be familiar to some of you if you saw my old uh, Jackson Pollock Lee Krasner program uh, uh, from last year. 
but I just, I couldn't leave her out. This, this portrait here just screams fierce, doesn't it? <laughs> this is Lee Krasner, who was born Lena Krasner. Um, she was a first generation American, born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, to a Ukrainian Jewish uh, family. She was the youngest of six kids. And she said that essentially she never put any demands on her parents. And so they let her do as she pleased. They let her become an artist. And she said that was really the best thing that could have happened. She started to study painting seriously as a teenager. And um, she made this self-portrait when she was just 19 years old as part of the admissions process for the National Academy of Design, where she was assigned to do a self-portrait. And in this case, she chose to work outside. Uh, the folks at the National Academy of Design said, that's a dirty trick you played. Don't ever pretend you painted outdoors. It's like they couldn't believe her talent here. And yet here she is staring out at us with almost like a piercing gaze. She's just looking. You can tell that she is so carefully assessing her um, her own image in a mirror in order to to capture it on canvas that um, that it gives us the striking sense in terms of who she was and it was right around this time that she dropped her birth name she favored Lee for Lena and um, and she also thought that Lee was well it, it is androgynous uh, so this painting really stands as this crucial moment in not only her development of an artistic style but her very sense of self. Now, anyone who's familiar with Lee Krasner probably already knows that she grew up to be an abstract expressionist and then married probably, arguably, the most famous abstract expressionist artist of all time, that is Jackson Pollock. And, um, and he's famous for those drip and splatter paintings that you can see him making on the floor over here. So Jackson Pollock um, was... Uh, was a man that struggled with his own demons. He suffered from mental illness. He struggled with alcoholism and Lee Krasner uh, sort of sequestered him away from his bad influences. They had this uh, house out on Long Island where he worked out in the barn and um, and she worked in the house still producing uh, uh, abstract expressionist work. And, um, and the entire time they were married, she kind of put his career in front of hers. She was always working the phones, trying to get his, his artwork seen by collectors and curators and critics. And all the while she was sort of teaching him about the fundamentals of modern art and how, how to kind of change his artwork so that it fit into this narrative. Uh, she served an integral role in his profession and she was so oftentimes in the shadows but i wanted to share with you a few of her works just to give you a sense of her remarkable capabilities now i keep saying she was an abstract expressionist and what that means is that she and her husband were both painting these works that were abstract and um and non-objective meaning that they don't make a uh, or they don't attempt to make any sort of reference to the material world that we live in. It's literally just paint on canvas. And it's a completely different process to, I think, enjoy and understand these works. With an image like this from 1947, it's just called abstract number, number two, I think that there's so much pleasure in trying to understand the various veils of paint that she's added to this picture. It looks as though she started with the blue and then maybe laid in this, this thicker tracery work of, of, this, um, of this black paint. And then the white kind of comes in almost more calligraphic in places. Sometimes it looks like it's going over the black, sometimes maybe a little bit underneath. Um, so our timeline is a little bit fuzzy here in terms of how she created it. And then just these little dabs of red and yellow paint that always remind me of like falling leaves in autumn. There's so much to excavate here with your eyes. And I think that there's just tremendous pleasure in doing that. Now, the beauty of, of Lee Krasner is that she was never just one thing. Her husband was basically just the splatter paintings, but she was constantly innovating. And within the space of just a year or two, she was creating these works that are strikingly different. Um, I love these tight little uh, compositions here. These were both made in 1949. I, I believe that they're both untitled works as well. And we can see just a remarkable amount of control in these pictures. They all seem like grids. When I, whenever I see um, 
either one of these works, they just remind me of like looking down at a city, a uh, very carefully planned city and getting the sense that she was making these rules for, you know, what shape to come up with next. And then as she's making the rules, kind of breaking the rules as well. These images look um, like ancient glyphs, but also like modern symbols in some way. There's something really remarkable about what she's doing here. Now, the same year that she created these works, um, she and her husband's paintings were featured in an exhibition called Artists, Man and Wife. The husband can be a man, but the wife is just a wife, right? And a reviewer said there's a tendency among some of these wives to tidy up their husband's styles. Lee Krasner, Mrs. Jackson Pollock, takes her husband's paint and changes his unrestrained sweeping lines into neat little squares and triangles. And I would say that is not giving her nearly enough credit for what she's doing here. I'll also say that it's around this time that she begins signing her works just simply with L and K as in Lee Krasner. And, um, and that was because she didn't want any assumptions about her gender to influence the way people read these paintings. That was a real struggle um, in terms of how her work was received. Uh, within the space of a couple of years, she is, again, exploring kind of another format in terms of art making. And she was exceptionally good at collage. This work is called Burning Candles. Over here on the right, it's called Bald Eagle. And what she would do is she would actually tear up her old drawings, and sometimes even some of Jackson Pollock's drawings, and then um, apply them to canvases and then paint around them. So she has this wonderful sense of composition, of color, of form, and it's all coming together here in these very innovative works. Uh, moving quickly along, Jackson Pollock uh, died in 1956. So, um, so Lee Krasner was still quite young when that happened. And he had passed away in kind of an alcohol-fueled car crash. And from that point on, she sort of gets a second chapter. She gets to step out from behind his shadow and sort of reinvent herself. So we see this photograph of her here. She's taken over the barn where he used to paint. And look at how confident she looks in this space now. She starts painting on a grand scale as well. This is a major work called Combat from right around the same time, if I remember correctly, sorry, from 1965. And we see this sense of combat, this struggle, this conflict playing out, not just in these huge swirling shapes that seem to um, curve back into themselves, but with the struggle between these colors, the orange and, and the, this bright hot pink here as well. So Lee's, Lee Krasner was constantly uh, redefining herself. And though she also worked to preserve the reputation and the legacy of her husband, she was able to forge her own identity independent of that. She was an artistic pioneer who's finally getting the respect she deserves. She bucked expectations for her gender and fought hard to be recognized in her own right. For that, she certainly qualifies as fierce. All right, our next artist is one of my all-time favorites. This is Faith Ringgold, who is still alive today and making work at the age of 93. During her long career, she examined race and racism, as well as womanhood and feminism. And we can see from this self-portrait from 1965 that she is someone who is really um, sort of adept at synthesizing all these things that were happening in the art world and then finding a solution that was uniquely her own. She like developed this realistic style, she called it super realism, to talk about race in America in the 1960s. And, um, and she wanted to do it in a style that people would understand and quickly, um, and quickly grasp. So these are two works from her, um, from her uh, uh, a series from this time period. And um, again, in the super realistic style, this is called Between Friends from 1963 over here, where we see a black woman and a white woman um, seemingly engaging with each other, but also uh, in these distinct architectural spaces that seem to be separating them. We see this softness and maybe even an impulse to connect on the face of the black woman, but the white woman has this kind of hard grimace here and maybe would be more difficult to connect with. This was in fact based on experiences that Faith Ringgold had in, um, in kind of polite socialization with uh, the white women who uh, who 
whose husbands were so oftentimes supporting black causes. It was sometimes only in, in name only, I should say. And, and she found those relationships could oftentimes be very superficial. Over on the right, we see a work that's called the in crowd. And we see this pile of businessmen in professional attire. They all kind of have these dead eyes, don't they? Um, they're stacked on top of each other, almost like they were in some sort of like cheerleader pyramid here. And we notice that the oldest of them with the whitest hair is at the top. And he, and as we look down, more and more of these figures are pushing others down. One of them is even um, sort of muzzling this man here, we notice that the people with the with the darker skin are at the bottom. Faith Ringgold emphasizes that it all rolls downhill with these red um, arrows at the top here as well. So certainly talking about uh, dynamics in America at the time. She made a pretty bold statement with this next work here, which is called U.S. A Postage uh, Commemorating the Advent of Black Power. This is from 1967. Of course, this is a stamp that never existed. This is a massive painting. It's about six feet wide. And she's done some very smart things here, some very bold things. This is an image that contains a hundred faces. It's really just the eyes and the noses, but it's like those dead-eyed stares again. It's like these faces that are looking right through you with no empathy, no concern. Um, and I'm sure, and I'm sure this, uh, to a certain extent, is speaks to her experience. You know, walking down the streets of New York, and the way she, um, the way she felt like white people were looking at her or through her. Now notice there are some black faces here and they create this diagonal. And um, that diagonal is crossed by these black letters here that spell out black power. So we have this X going across our postage stamp, which seems like a maybe a little reference to the, um, the Confederate flag or maybe even Malcolm X. But there's um, there are two more words here that are really important, and they're much more subtle. And those are the words white power. Maybe you even miss them, but here's our W sideways. Here's our H. There's the I. There's the T. So here she is making a pretty profound comment on um, on sort of how these two different powers are, are seen and how they exist in America um, in the 1960s. So a pretty bold statement. Now, <laughs> Faith Ringgold was somebody who was not afraid to take it to the streets. She was an activist. And so um, she would show up to protest, you know, the, the lack of representation of Black artists, of women artists, what have you. And she would oftentimes make posters for these protests. I love these two posters. Um, you know, the, the, the thinking behind them or the word choice is very simple in this case, just woman freedom now over here and woman free yourself. But I want to draw your attention to this image over here on the left and the way she designed it. She was inspired by these textiles from Africa. And essentially what we're looking at is a square that's been subdivided into eight triangles like this. And perhaps looking at those textiles is what led her to the next phase of her career and really how she's best known. And that is for the, these art quilts that she started making. The, here is Faith Ringgold making her very first quilt with her mother who, um, who sort of guided her through this process because her mother had been a fashion designer. And, um, and with this, Faith Ringgold does something incredible. She takes uh, this art form that was considered kind of women's handiwork, it's kind of a lower form of craft, and she elevates it into this male sphere of fine art. Um, not only because she's sewing with fabric, but also because she's oftentimes painting on the fabric as well. I'll tell you, it's um, <laughs> it's a little bit of a headache for art curators because they don't quite know how to categorize these works, but, um, but she begins to do something really innovative. Uh, this is that particular work, it's called Echoes of Harlem. And now we have full faces here, um, all faces of black and brown people and a sense of their full humanity here. It's not about those dead eyes anymore. We've come a long way from the advent of Black Power postage stamp. Now, um, we could spend a long time talking about Faith Ringgold's work, but I'll just touch on probably her most famous quilt here from 1991, which is called Tar Beach. It's part, part of a series about these, uh, about these families, really, that go up to the roof of their New York City building on a hot night 
the parents are eating out and, um, or at least eating outside. And the kids are just lying down on this mattress. Tar Beach refers to the roof of the building itself. And as they're looking up at the sky, they're imagining floating through the stars across the top of the city this way. And Ringgold actually writes out the story of what they're thinking and seeing uh, on the quilt itself. She turns this uh, this story into a book, and the book has won all sorts of awards. You can even go on YouTube and hear her reading the book. Um, it's so charming and so smart. So uh, we're calling out the voices of authority, especially in a white male-dominated do art world, and also for elevating a traditionally woman's craft into the world of fine art. Faith Ringgold definitely qualifies as fierce. Now, this next artist here is, um, is Marie Sol Escobar. And she was probably best known in the 1960s as simply Marisol. She did one name before Madonna did. Marisol is like a nickname of Marie Sol. Um, but the the decision to to uh, not use her last name was a very conscious decision on her part to drop any sort of patrilineal associations from her identity. So she has that in common with a couple of the other artists that we've already looked at tonight. She was Venezuelan American. She had, um, I think she was born in Paris. So she had this kind of um, privileged upbringing, but also suffered a, a great loss at a young age. I think when she was just 11 years old, her mother uh, died by suicide. And that that uh, severely traumatized young Marisol so much th so that she chose to become mute for uh, about the next 10 years of her life. Rarely spoke, just did enough to, um, to, to pass her schoolwork, but, um, but sort of forced herself to suffer in a number of ways as, as, um, as, a, as a means of processing her mother's death. But through that all, she liked art. She liked drawing, she liked embroidering, she liked going to museums. She even went to Rome to study sculpture. By the time she came back in her late 20s, she was quickly associated with the pop art movement. So here she is sitting next to none other than Andy Warhol. Um, he, he described her as the first girl artist with glamour. And I think he was just completely charmed by her. He featured her in several of his films. He loved how sort of mysterious she was. You know, she didn't talk that much. And, and to a certain extent, Warhol even uh, um, adopted that same kind of affect for himself, being a little bit mysterious. Now, even though she was this very feminine beauty, it's a little surprising that she chose to work in sculpture and in wood. This is a portrait that she created of her friend Andy Warhol over here. And so it's a, a, essentially these two wooden blocks that mimic the shape of someone seated. We can see in the back that it actually has wooden chair legs attached to the sculpture, but in the front, the chair legs are simply painted on. We can see a portrait of Andy Warhol in the front and then also on the sides where he's looking in different directions. Um, it appears as though he his legs are crossed, uh, um, at least in the drawing or the painting on, on the wooden box here. But then she also adds real shoes coming out from this hole at the bottom of the sculpture, which I just love because it always makes me feel like there's a person trapped in there. She took a cast of her own hands and she placed them there as, as Andy Warhol's hands. So, um, so I, I always think that that's like a little poignant way of, of, um, of, of, of appreciating their friendship. Now, what makes this pop art? <laughs> uh, she was ready and willing to acknowledge celebrity culture and a culture of commodity in the same way that so many of her male contemporaries were. This is, of course, a portrait of John Wayne with a real hat on top of a wooden block head and this cartoonish uh, red horse that seems to be galloping at top speed um, in front of us here. But her work is generally regarded as something a little bit different because she had uh, a feminist slant to her sculpture and her sculpture groups here. And by that, I mean, she was willing to criticize uh, contemporary notions of femininity and women's roles. And she wasn't afraid to include herself 
in those criticisms, which I think kind of helped to soften them or make them land it with, without as hard of a punch. This is called um, Women and Dog from 1963. So we can see these three women and a child and a dog, very funny looking dog, out for a walk. And she has, Marisol has casted her own face uh, multiple times to show that these women seem to be um, just looking all around as they as they walk, almost as though they um, they understand that they are on display as they promenade here, and maybe as though they're even looking to be seen in this moment. Notice that the central figure here with these kind of uh, breasts attached to the wooden box body also has the face of Marisol. In this case, just a, a photograph of her. So she is kind of commenting on women's roles in society and how they're viewed. And um, I mean, even sort of going back to these old notions that we started with at the beginning of the program about um, women in art and, and this, uh, this tension between being objectified and, and, um, and being actually seen. Now, one of Marisol's greatest works is right here in New England at the Courier Museum of Art, my hometown museum. And this one is called The Family from that same year of 1963. It's just a remarkable work. And another kind of pointed criticism about women in America at the time, we've got another uh, cast face from the artist, uh, but in this case, the mother of this family, who also has like the attached breasts and a polka dot dress, has this hat that is pulled down over her eyes and her mouth is wide open. So we get the sense that she can't see, but she can speak, which sort of um, implies that she's uninformed, right? But still... Um, but still sharing ideas. She's literally boxed in here by all of her children, two little girls on either side. One of them is actually holding a doll that even has Marisol's face on it. Notice too that she has three legs to perhaps suggest that this family is actually moving forward. But there seems to be a divide here because the father the of this family is portrayed in a completely different way. He's in a flatter box that is actually affixed to the wall here. It doesn't stand independently. And um, and it looks almost coffin-like, like he's kind of boxed in here. And he is the only one that has these real legs and, and the real shoes that are, are grounded here. So uh, she's making a commentary certainly about this woman, this mother, but then perhaps about the family too, so much so that in 1970, this work was featured on the cover of Time magazine with the title, The U.S. Family, Help! <laughs> so for overcoming her own family hardships as a child, for including herself in her criticisms of femininity, and for producing striking work in an unexpected material, Marisol definitely qualifies as fierce. On to our last artist of the evening, and I'm sorry, we're just a little bit late. This is um, Cindy Sherman, and um, Cindy Sherman went to college to study painting, uh, but quickly realized that she that she liked uh, photography a little bit better, and that she would use herself as a as, as a canvas. She was an artist that used costumes, makeup, prosthetics, all of these materials to construct brand new identities that she, that she would then photograph. So she was um, not surprisingly very interested in trying on. Uh, sort of playing dress up as a child, but um, but it, it's not just about dressing up, it's really about transformation when it comes to Cindy Sherman. These are, are this series of images, uh, student work that she did in college when she realized that she wasn't going to study painting, that her face made a better canvas. And so we can see how she transforms herself from this kind of bookish, studious looking figure to a real vamp down here. And so it's part of it, her work is about the transformation and part of of it is about the, the photograph of, of that. Now she could paint a celebrity's face on her own. Um, here she is painted up to look like uh, Lucille Ball. But for the most part, she was just interested in the faces of people that she saw on the street. She would kind of carefully study people and then go home and think, could I recreate 
uh, who they were on my own face. And she wasn't afraid to make herself unappealing to the male gaze. She just wanted to try it all out. Very quickly, she even did a student project where inspired by the people that she saw riding the bus as a student, she staged a series of photographs called the bus riders. And she, uh, using clothes that she got at like thrift stores and that sort of thing, uh, um, essentially established a new identity for each one of these shots, um, a personality all their own, uh, physical language, uh, makeup, oftentimes visible makeup, and, uh, and a costume to, uh, to assume this new identity. And with this series, we also see kind of the theatricality to her work, the the markings on the floor, the the shoes that were for a different character discarded over here. And one of the elements I love so much, the cord that attached to her little clicker for the camera so that she could take the um the picture from from uh from in front of the camera there. Now, from there, she moved to New York City, a place that she felt very uncomfortable. Uh, she was always a little bit scared. I think it was the summer of Sam that she moved there. And so she did a series called Film Stills, where she tried to kind of recreate these film noir um, moments uh, that she captured it with just, with just a, a, a photographic camera. And sort of leaves out the details let's let's the uh, the viewer here fill in the narrative but once again she is assuming a, a totally different identity and um and constructing a sort of open-ended story for us in each one of these photographs and for the most part these women are always in some sort of vulnerable position we never quite uh, know who they're looking at off camera but whenever i look at this one for instance i always imagine that this is a woman who has just gotten into like a heated argument with a lover and and the groceries have fallen and she's looking up at him sort of defiantly here once again notice the little cord that is going back so that she could actually work the shutter the camera now to quickly finish up on cindy sherman we can see that there's a broad range here over the course of this career that she's had she's truly a chameleon she gives us the beautiful the reverential the silly the satirical and the downright ugly <laughs> now she's explored image making, stereotypes, archetypes, and historical references to produce this profound commentary on women in society. In a world where women are constantly changing themselves to try and be younger and more beautiful, Cindy Sherman's explorations of character and costume are done without regard for the male gaze, and I think that makes her especially fierce. Now we have the quickest of conclusions here, and I, again, I'm sorry we went a little long, but the women that we've met today were able to stake their claim in the arts despite numerous obstacles. Some of them changed their names, some of them changed their appearances, all of them found innovative ways to change the art world. So I will end there for now and uh, uh, I welcome any questions or comments you have. I'll start looking at the chat here again. Thanks for your patience for me going a little bit long, but I was in my glory tonight. I thank you all for being here. I just love this subject so much. I'm going to start with the Q&A. Judith says, oh, her left leg seems uh, in, a, in an impossible position. I wonder if Judith was referring to Dorothea Lang, perhaps with that one. Um, somebody else said, did Dorothea Lang pay these people to photograph them? That's a great question. I believe she was not paying them. And of course, uh, there's been a real evolution in terms of the way people think about this issue in uh, documentary photography today, or even photojournalists, um, not necessarily that they're um, paying them, but that you might get their names, for instance, or um, or that there is a, 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 an ethical uh, a dilemma there in in the work that that uh, documentary photographies or uh, photographers are doing. So you're you're good to point that out. And somebody else asked, what is the average size of Lee Krasner's paintings? Um, the ones that I've seen in person, uh, I would say are generally probably about uh, three feet wide, somewhere around there. Um, of course, uh, the bigger one that we ended with, the the, the combat work that had the, the hot pink and the orange, just to fly back there really quickly. This is much larger, I think. I might have even captured the uh, the dimensions here. Um, 
maybe not. Uh, but I think if I'm remembering, I, I think this one is like over six feet long. It's it's a pretty impressive work. So her work definitely got much bigger um, later in her life when she's working in the barn uh, and she has the space to to move uh, spread out. So we can see here too some larger works behind her. Uh, someone else asked, what materials is the dog made from with the woman in the dog sculpture? Great question. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it's got a wooden base there. And I wonder if she just got like a stuffed dog and added a collar there and the little chain. It is a very funny looking dog and um, it piques my interest too, but I'm sorry, I don't have the specific details on the material. Um, April asks, who was the first artist you showed? Her name was Sofanispa Anguasola. Try saying it 10 times fast. Um, I'll just go back to the list of artist names. That might be helpful for people too, as they're um, trying to remember all the details from tonight. Um, the first photo across from the king. Judith, um, the first photo across from the king. I'm sorry, Judith, I'm not sure if I know which one you're talking about. Um, Dottie says, when you say that five copies were made of the Marie Antoinette painting, did you mean the artist painted it five times? I believe that is the way it worked. Um, five copies were ordered and I know that uh, Vigie Le Lebrun uh, were uh, painted those in particular. Uh, and I don't know if that counts towards the, the entirety of like the 30 paintings that she did of Marie Antoinette, but I, I think that's the case. Um, Karen asks, where did you say Marisol's family work is located? It's in Manchester, New Hampshire at the Courier Museum of Art. You might want to double check that it's on view before, um, before you come and visit. Uh, there's a number of New England institutions that have works by say, uh, Faith Ringgold, uh, oh, um, some of those art quilts, but because they're on fabric they're almost never on view unfortunately I can't remember the last time I saw the Courier's uh, Faith Ringgold uh, um, painted quilt but there was just a show at, at the um, the Worcester Museum of Art that featured their incredible painted quilt so it might it might still be on but it, it might go off view for for some time after that um, I think that's everything in the q and I'm going to turn my attention over to the chat and there's a lot of very kind words here. I'm going to copy and paste all of these so I can enjoy them later on. I really appreciate everybody's kind words here. Um, let's see. It looks like going way back to the beginning. Um, <laughs> oh, um, Ray says, uh, in talking about Yoko Ono, um, uh, I... I, I'm, I'm glad that you shared your initial impression here, this idea that that it seems silly as performance art, but that it does powerfully convey its point and image. It's um, it's such an uncomfortable piece. I'm sure you can probably find videos of the performance too. I remember watching it back in grad school and it just, it made my skin crawl um, because she just made herself so vulnerable. I think she actually restaged this um, sometime in maybe the past 10 years or so. Um, and then we see, oh, uh, Francine says, Alice Neal painted herself as a 65 year old woman. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathy says, can the chat be deferred? Okay. And I think Cheryl's referring to um, some Dorothea Lange fo photographs here. Um, Oh, and the rep, Francine, you're good to mention the, the Dust Bowl too. So these Okies were people who were uh, escaping, uh, you know, the, these horrible drought conditions that existed in the in the Midwest. Um, she also added that Dorothea Ling had a retrospective at MoMA in 2020, just at the start of lockdown. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sure a lot of people miss seeing it. Uh, Lisa, oh, Lisa's here. Thanks for joining us tonight, Lisa. Uh, noted uh, that, yes, the book Ninth Street Women, if you're interested in, in um, artists like Krasner and de Kooning, that's a great place to get started. Cheryl says the cover of another book, this one is a children's book, I think probably referring to Faith Ringgold. And um, looks like a few people got to see uh, her show at, in Worcester. And um, Janine is here. She saw Marisol's Bob Hope at the National Gallery in DC. Uh, that's a great work to look up if you're interested uh, in another Marisol sculpture. It uh, looks very much like Bob Hope. 
And <laughs> Francie says, I'm surprised to see Cindy Sherman look so normal. Um, all of these comments are, are are a lot of fun. I just and and I really appreciate the um, the very kind words that are coming through too. I just uh, I'm scrolling quickly through them just to make sure I'm not missing any pressing comments here. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, everybody, for your very kind words. I think we got to mostly everything. Uh, since we're already going a little bit long, I, I won't keep you here any longer. But if you had a pressing question for me, please feel free to reach out to me on my website, which I is IamCulturallyCurious.com. I'll just scroll to the back of the presentation where that is. IamCulturallyCurious.com. Uh, I always love to hear from people. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about these incredible women um, and to give me the little ego boost that you've given me with all these nice, wor nice words. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Next month, what are we doing? Oh, Claude Monet. Are you ready for Claude Monet? I've put this together in a very unusual way. It's not gonna be a straight chronology. So we'll have a sort of a new perspective on Claude Monet. We'll have a lot of fun with that. So I hope you can join us then and again, Thank you, everybody. Have a great night and, um, and we will see you soon. Take care.